And I would like to invite Daniel Croft now, who's a tour de force in, in the technologies that are being inv inv invented. So for those of you uh, who haven't uh, witnessed him present before, get ready for that. <laughs> no pressure, no pressure. <laughs> we can uh, switch over to my slides, and I'll stand up, because sitting is the new smoking, right? So, um, <laughs> so thanks. Real honor and pleasure to be here and to follow on. Um, from the opening, because you know, I'll be talking a bit about technology, but it's really how it integrates into a system, and the NHS has such an opportunity as it's doing to start to integrate these technologies to bring them uh, to uh, impact us from, from prevention to therapy to diagnostics and beyond. And um, you know, it is often great to be in London, because as was mentioned, I was actually uh, born here down the street at the Royal Free Hospital, um, and I was actually uh, back here last June, and with my friend Shafi Ahmad, got to uh, explore Royal, Royal London Hospital, uh, both the old parts uh, and the new parts, and meet some of the older patients, like uh, the elephant man who's still there. Um, but you know, it's really interesting to have the perspective of, of the past as you meet the future, um, because so many technologies are moving quickly uh, and converging. It gives us a real opportunity to rethink and reimagine healthcare across the spectrum. And we'll, we'll touch on these very briefly in this 20 minutes, from our own personal health and wellness and prevention side, um, that's more and more incentivized for our patients and beyond, doing a better job of diagnosis at stage zero as opposed to late stage, how we can advance therapy and make that new, more tuned, personalized, and, and uh, targeted, how technology can be democratized around the planet, and finally, how we can all be part of participatory healthcare, increasingly uh, to do clinical trials, crowdsourcing, uh, and beyond. So as we look to the past and the future, as is always already set up today, it's always interesting to look at what the past used to look like. And remember, last week was Back to the Future Week. Um, I'm still waiting for my hoverboard. You can get some on Kickstarter. Um, uh, clinical trials is an area that still seems back uh, in the 18th century. Um, but uh, I had a chance myself to go back to the future. I went to medical school at Stanford and recently was at the 200th anniversary of Mass General Hospital. 200 is very old for the US, very young for here. I uh, had a chance to be with the house staff that I trained with. And one night, I found myself in one of the most famous spots of healthcare history, called the Ether Dome which back in 1846 uh, is where uh, the patient in this very picture, this is before HIPAA privacy laws, uh, was the very first patient to get general anesthesia with her surgery. And you can go back and visit the Ether Dome today, just like you can visit the uh, Elephant Man, um, and it's pretty much frozen in time. Looks like it did in 1846. Not much has changed in the room. Um, and I was shocked and dismayed when I walked about two minutes away to the ward where I spent my first month as a brand new medic or intern in the 1990s that that was also frozen in time. Um, same alarms were beeping, had a little PTSD, some of the same nurses, some of the same patients. The only difference was a young, uh, young intern or medic on, on call had to push around an eight-year-old laptop, type out the medical record, print it out, put it in the paper chart, and the front desk there is still using the cutting edge cutting edge medical communication tool of our day, not the London Mail, uh, the fax machine, right? Um, so even at a great institution like MGH or, or many of the institutions here in London, healthcare is still being practiced like 1846 in old silos and old mindsets and old ways of thinking. But we're in this new connected age, this digital age, this genomic age. We have the opportunity to rethink and reimagine healthcare outside of the bucket of body parts and subspecialties and to rewire it uh, as we attempt to disrupt and dramatically improve uh, healthcare, not only here in the developing world, but in emerging markets as well. So if you think about our healthcare system, it's really much more of a sick care system. It's sort of um, stuck in intermittent and episodic models. Intermittent meaning occasionally we get the blood pressure check, the EKG, you might scribble your numbers home uh, and fax them in or drop them in the mail to your NHS medic. Um, so the data we get is often episodic and therefore we're reactive. We wait for the heart attack, uh, the stroke, or the lump to be discovered at late stage. We're still waiting weeks for that uh, clinic visit and then are waiting half an hour for the 12 minute visit on average, at least in the US, whether you're here in London or, or in Calcutta. And we can, I think, reshape the thinking not just through technology, but by the incentives and the culture of innovation and how we reward both clinicians, nurses, and patients uh, as we looked into the future. So part of that, again, is where we set the incentives. Uh, in the US, we practice a lot of fee-for-service medicine. That's why we're spending about 80% of our healthcare on the folks who already have advanced chronic disease. And those incentives are changing, this new world of value-based care, outcome-based care, where your, yourself, your doc, your medic, your healthcare systems can be rewarded for keeping you healthier, or when you have a chronic disease, for managing it in smarter ways. And, well, and, and the incentives are shifting where healthcare happens, not just in the traditional ER or ICU or intensive care unit, but increasingly outside the hospital, never to be admitted in the first place, uh, and bringing healthcare to our homes and technologies onto, uh, onto our bodies. 
Uh, and one of the framing piece now is you, as the empowered consumer, get more and more transparency, comparing one hospital down the street to another, or what the price is for uh, a, a, a pharmacy drug, comparing one pharmacy to another. So in many ways, with new sort of scorecards, you can look at an individual procedure, individual surgeons in an individual hospital, and see how they're doing. So the Yelp of medicine is coming, and hopefully that improves things uh, as we move forward. So um, a lot of these new shifts, whether we call it digital health, connected health, are, are riding exponential trends, as, as Vishal mentioned. The most obvious one is Moore's Law, the technology in our pocket. These supercomputers have had a billion times the price and speed of performance of a supercomputer from MIT in the 70s. Your tablets uh, are more powerful than a Cray supercomputer in the 70s. And this is an example of an exponential technology, doubling in, in, in price and speed performance. And it's where I think the opportunity for real change and disruption occurs. Um, and I want you to sort of learn to think exponentially, because our, our brains aren't really wired that way. If I took 30 linear steps, I'll be to the exit sign. But if I'm taking exponential steps, doubling every time, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, et cetera, by the 30th step, I'm at a billion. That's 26 times around the planet. And that's the power of exponentials, not just with Moore's Law, but many other converging, which is why you know, the desktop of 2000 fits on your smartphone, now fits on your smartwatch. Um, uh, and, and remember, we've only had smartphones for about seven years. Imagine what they'll be able to do another seven years from now. We're already at the point with shrinking exponential technologies of a computer the size of a grain of rice. That brings the Internet of Things to the Internet of Healthcare, to the Internet of the Body. So tremendous opportunity to leverage, the, of course, the big data and massive zettabytes of information that are coming from there, and not just making that big data, but small, actionable information we can use as our, for ourselves, for our patients, uh, and for society. So digital health is one of those buzzwords, connected health, mobile health. I think soon it's just going to be called health. We don't call it digital music or digital movies. But it provides a framework of, of shifting and converging uh, all sorts of technologies together to make them useful. And again, I think it's this message of convergence, not just with IT, but 3D printing, robotics, drones, nanotechnology, synthetic biology. And at their intersection, where the real opportunity for shift occurs and for new thinking to come from people outside of healthcare uh, to reshape things. Because we have many grand challenges, many of them are well illustrated, from the aging demographic to uh, the access issues uh, to what do we do with the big data, how do we unsilo it. And while many technologies are often here, and you'll see some today, how do we uh, get our regulators to think exponentially and our payers uh, to figure out how to reward um, some of these new innovations? So disruptions all around us. You've seen many examples uh, uh, in many ways uh, that's changed even in the last decade. Um, co uh, companies like Kodak uh, were not thinking exponentially. And uh, even though they invented digital photography, uh, a couple years ago, they're bankrupt. And, and 12 kids down the street from me who built Instagram sold that to Facebook for a billion dollars, which is now chump change, right? Um, that was their Kodak moment. Um, so the challenge for all of us is not, not to be the Kodak, the Blackberry, or the Blockbuster, to be the disruptor, not the disruptee. And Uber is an often cited example of innovation. But think about it. It's only a five-year-old company. They didn't invent the smartphone, GPS, online maps, online payments, limos, or taxis. They connected the dots. So who's going to build the Uber of healthcare? Well, Uber even did a pilot for healthcare in New York last year. You slide it over, press a button, and a nurse will come on an Uber and give you a flu shot, right? So this Uberification is coming. There are companies now where you can press a button on your smartphone, and a doctor comes to your home or apartment in New York. You know, I'm not sure what kind of doctor you get, but you get a doctor. And Remember, they can rate you and you can rate them, so that transparency element's there. It's coming to pharma, which are challenged by, by new mo modes of you know, digiceuticals and blockbuster drugs and go, going to N of 1. So the challenge is to be the disruptor, not the disruptee. So I come from Silicon Valley. I chair the medicine track, as was mentioned, at, at something called Singularity University, only seven years old. Uh, there are tracks in biotech, robotics, AI, 3D printing, nanotechnology, and more. We ask where are technologies going, how do they converge, and how do we use those to address grand challenges from poverty and education to healthcare? And in our 10-week summer programs, uh, about half the new companies and ideas that come out have been focused in the healthcare space. And because so many folks, even within and without, without uh, side of medicine, don't often come together to innovate together. Uh, five years ago, I put together a program, first called Future Med, now called Exponential Medicine. We have some alumni here uh, in the room and some coming this year, uh, that brings and crosses the silos and technologies to ask, where can we take healthcare? Um, and it's, uh, some of you will be joining us next week. You can also follow along. We'll have a live stream at exponentialmedicine.com. So hopefully um, some of you can come in person next year. We have some of our faculty, from Catherine Moore to, to Tony Young, who uh, runs, uh, helps run UH, uh, NHS uh, Innovation as well. So let's look at a few of these buckets quickly. Health and prevention, right? We're in this age now where we know it's our behaviors that are actually more impactful than our genomics in terms of impacting long-term health. We have new ways of tracking our behaviors. Who's here wearing a Fitbit or tracking device? I've got like six of them on right now, okay? All right? how many of you lost yours or the battery doesn't work anymore, right? You know, so this is the early sort of 
uh, consumer side of what's often called quantified self, tracking your steps and your sleep with pretty basic technologies. I would argue we're moving from quantified self to quantified health. We're going to be integrated into every element of our health and medicine, from prevention to diagnostics to therapeutics. The sensors are converging and emerging from just the simple step trackers to the ones you'll hear about from Proteus that can be embedded in your actual tablet. We're seeing these sensors evolve from not just wearables to incitables. You know, Google, of all places, has developed a contact lens that can track blood sugar, and they're partnering with big pharma, pharma Novartis, to bring this to market. We're moving from just wearables to the idea of trainables, like this posture sensor out of Israel that'll buzz your back when you're hunched over for too long, and after a week or so of being your digital nanny, well, you'll, you'll sort of be cured of, of bad posture, so feedback loops are important. We're seeing medicalized versions of these. Your, your physician may prescribe you a wearable to track your blood pressure, your heart rate in real time. Rings that can be sleep labs. All these things are coming together in interesting ways, embedded in our clothes, in our cars. This internet of things, maybe coming to your diaper, right? This used to be the future. But actually, Huggies came out last year with TweetPee. You can figure out what that does. Um, there's also data for number two, uh, sometimes too much information, right? I'm a pediatrician. This could be useful. Other things you can quantify, your breath. You know, a company called Breathometer makes a little sensor that can track your uh, blood alcohol level and lock you out of your car and call you an Uber if it's too high. But this can also now track the quality of your breath and your hydration status. Your voice can be quantified in terms of your emotional status. Um, nano noses are picking up cancer at early stages. Wi-Fi has been developed by, by MIT engineers to be able to pick up vital signs seamlessly without wearing anything. So we have new ways of picking up this digital exhaust. The challenge, again, is what do we do with it? It's a lot of information, terabytes of individual data per day, living in the cloud or elsewhere. How do we make sense of it? How do we um, develop sort of a Google Now for health? You know, when you look at your watch, it reminds you not just to, to, to leave early based on traffic, but to check into the gym and not the fast food restaurant. My Apple Watch already tells me to stand up, sitting being the new smoking, but it's not yet contextual. It doesn't know if I'm flying in an airplane or driving. These things will start to improve. And again, we'll have access to this information almost everywhere. I encourage you to unplug sometimes. It's actually very good for your brain. Um, but um, new ways of accessing this information is going to be exploding exponentially. The challenge is how do we bring that to the clinic? It's only been in the last year that companies like, like Google, uh, Apple, Samsung are enabling data to flow through your smartphone into your medical record. It's being piloted in the US. So literally, I can prescribe a blood pressure cuff, a glucometer, and that data can flow through in seamless ways. And then what does this data mean? We don't know what the digital vital sign fingerprints look like. The baseline study, for example, is going to help figure that out. And maybe develop our own sort of personalized, integrated score for our health. It's not just our vitals and our blood pressure. It may be your social network and your mental status all coming together to give things that we can tune and incentivize across the system. No clinician, patient, or individual wants, though, to look at reams of data and APIs and apps. We need to blend this into something I like to call predictalytics. What does this data mean? You know, a good intensive care unit doctor can see a patient going septic early based on the blood pressure and heart rate and temperature. What if we had that same sort of sensibility wired into our health? Kind of like our modern cars. Modern cars now have 400 sensors in them. You don't care or know about most of them. You care about when your check engine light goes on. Hopefully that check engine light is tuned to you, like it's different if it's a Corvette or a McLaren. And we'll have, I think, the equivalent of this in integration of information. These technologies are being commoditized. It's going to be what we do with this, kind of like this OnStar system in many General Motor cars that look at, looks at all your driving, can guide you. If you crash your car, calls 911. How can we have sort of an OnStar system for our body that overlaps all this? And companies are starting to do, th to do this. One of our exponential medicine grads, uh, graduates, Dr. J Jack Kreinler, based in London, co-founded a company called Centrian, using the sensors for the home to better manage chronic disease patients and keep them from bouncing back and forth to the hospital. We're seeing AI apps that can be a coach for your health, like this one called Lark that learns your steps, your activity, your act uh, and, and kind of is fun and engaging. And it even talks to my smartwatch and knows I'm jet lagged and can remind me to get more sleep tonight, hopefully. But soon these will be managing chronic diseases as well and can augment your medical team and call them when you're in trouble. And because behavior change is hard, what if you have a coach that shows you future you when you look in the mirror, right? Future you if you're losing weight, if you're working out, if you're doing your P90X, or future you if you keep having, you know, pastries for breakfast. You know, future you, right? Here's me now, here's me, you know, a thousand donuts later. You know, that changes my wiring, right? Or if some of you are medics and have uh, a young patient who's smoking, what if you can show what her skin's going to look like uh, if, you, if she smokes two packs a day? You know, this idea now of augmenting reality with what's coming can be powerful elements to one of the most challenging areas, which is behavior change, or what happens if you're spending too much time on Facebook as well, you know, other, other challenges. Um, 
Speaking of augmented virtual reality, this is starting to play an interesting role in healthcare. You all know about Google Glass, maybe not yet a hit in the, a hit in the consumer version, but these are already going to be used by surgeons and others to scribe information back, to pull information in real time, vital signs and beyond. It's very, this is as clunky as an iPhone 1 would seem today. These will play a role in interesting realms for education, learning anatomy, uh, education in many ways. Virtual reality, from the $3 billion acquisition now to the $12 cardboard version, is going to transform many elements of therapy and education. Um, Shafi Ahmad as well and colleagues have developed systems for, for example, teaching medical students and others to, to learn surgery wearing Oculus. So whole new ways to transport yourself to different environments and a lot of innovation I think will continue in that sphere. Part of precision, pre prevention is understanding our base risks, genomics. The price of sequencing your own genome has dropped at twice the rate of Moore's law to the point where it's about $1,000 today. The challenge is you get that on your disk drive, what do you do with it? Even if it's 50 pounds, 10 pounds, so what unless the, your clinician can use it? How does it become part of the workflow? How do we take the low-hanging fruit of things like pharmacogenomics to know what drug and what dose is most appropriate for a patient? A lot of that information is in here now, but it needs to come into the daily workflow of the patient and physician. Here's my pharmacogenomics, for example. My personal doctor doesn't even have this. You can even upload your genetic information. This new website can look at your genes and athletic performance, and sure enough, it shows pretty true to form. I'm a good sprinter, metabolic efficiency is high, not good at cross country, endurance is low. I want to get up and work out in the morning, have trouble getting out of bed, but I have an excuse. My motivation genes are low, right? So um, just an example of integrating this complex information in useful ways. And of course, it goes well beyond our genome now. There's the proteome, 10,000 biomarks from blood, exposome, where you've lived, the microbiome. We have 10 times more bacterial cells in our GI tract than human cells in our whole body. And we're learning those play a role in everything from inflammatory bowel disease to psychiatric disorders uh, to obesity. And we're learning how to use this therapeutically. In Boston, my whole hometown, we're starting to do fecal transplants to treat and cure C. difficile infections. I think we'll enter an era where we'll start doing fe not just fecal transplants, but microbiome transplants. In some cases, you might even want to bank your microbiome before taking antibiotics or going through uh, therapies like bone marrow transplantation, which is my clinical field. How about old school technologies could help uh, prevention and therapy? Uh, meditation and yoga, ancient technologies, which we're now melding with new ones, new insights into how our brains are wired, the connectome, how that plays a role in everything from autism to Alzheimer's. Now we have new tools where we can access our brain, consumer devices, brain-computer interfaces that you can wear off the shelf and look at your mindfulness states. What if I could prescribe this and say, hey, go meditate as opposed to taking an antidepressant or anti-anxiety med? Or these are now being used, for example, that, uh, to look, treat kids who have attention deficit disorder, who learn to focus. Um, so new ways of innovation is coming as these technologies converge. Or more advanced levels of being brain-computer interface at my alma mater, Brown University, can enable a quadriplegic patient to control a robotic limb. And that's going to get even more advanced, and we're going to start to not just enable, but super enable the disabled in the future. Um, moving on to even video games as a therapeutic um, for both improving our cognition or those who have deficits, even integrating that with movement is going to be shown to be a powerful therapeutic modality. Let's look at diagnosis. I'm an oncologist. We often pick up disease, unfortunately, late, stage three and stage four. What if we could move to stage zero diagnosis? For example, Alzheimer's, such a huge cost center, very difficult to treat or impossible once it's raised its advanced stage. What if now with new PET scans, blood-based biomarkers, eye tracking technologies, we can pick it up at stage zero, 10 or sometimes 20 years early. Maybe some of the new drugs in development that stop or reverse plaques could be given early, just like you might take a statin now to prevent cardiovascular disease. Diagnostics is changing to this whole new realm of a digital doctor's bag. What you should take a clinic or an ER can fit in your pocket. In some cases, individual devices are integrating these all together. What used to be, you know, need a dermatologist can be due tele telepresently. Soon we may, in some cases, not even need a dermatologist because we'll be using AI and analytics to say, is that a melanoma or a mole? So many low-hanging fruit diagnostic elements can be done by yourself at home or your primary care doctor using some new modalities. Colposcopy is being digitized. Uh, we're seeing the $100,000 cart of an ultrasound now fit in your pocket. It connects to your smartphone. You can Facebook your ultrasounds if you like, right? The old-fashioned uh, eye exam shrinking to a mobile device. Lots of these diagnostic realms are moving. And as, as was mentioned earlier, even the EKG invented here in the, in the UK can now fit on your smartphone and transmit that data anywhere and do the basic diagnostics for you. Uh, if we pass this around the room, we might find someone with heart block who doesn't know, doesn't know they have it. Uh, there's a new version coming to your, to your watch itself. Or more advanced versions, we'll hear from Proteus about their patch. This is one from a Bay Area company called uh, Vital Connect. It's a little Band-Aid, tracks your real-time EKG, temperature, posture, blood pressure, all that data streaming anywhere in the world that you could have a login access. Who's going to manage that data? Who's liable for it? How do we make sense of it and not just be overwhelmed from this? This has inpatient uses and outpatient uh, applications as well. Once you pick up a patient with cardiovascular disease, do you send them to the cath lab for an angiogram? 
This newly FDA and CE Mark te technology called HeartFlow can take a 30 second CT scan and send that data to the cloud where supercomputing convergence of modern math can figure out how narrow is the patient's blood vessel. Um, does that patient need a bypass or a stent? What kind of stent? Maybe we'll 3D print the stent to match that, match that patient's particular anatomy. And a lot of these new innovations, diagnostics or otherwise, are driven by new incentives. I've been an advisor for the XPRIZE. Uh, we've developed a $10 million prize sponsored by Qualcomm to make a medical tricorder inspired by Star Trek. You remember, you know, Bones McCoy, you know, he's dead, Jim. Well, the idea is, could we inspire teams to build a version of that in reality? So over 400 teams entered the competition. We're now in the final 10. One of them is started at Singularity University in our future medicine program. They developed the scanner to scout. It's in clinical trials today. You hold it to your forehead. It streams to your smartphone, your temperature, your blood pressure, calculates your uh, blood pressure, your uh, heart rate, your oxygen saturation. They partner with IBM to start making sense of this data. They crowdfunded the actual clinical trial. This might be something you have in all of your hands and your patients' hands in the next couple of years. And beyond that, for the laboratory component, if you need to do a urinalysis, do you have to come in and drop off a urine sample? No, you can do a little uh, urine dipstick, QR coded, and your mobile phone can look at the colors and, and make the call and send that to your primary care doc, to the Centers for Disease Control, to the NSA, whoever wants the information. Um, <laughs> same things might go, it might be flu season or Ebola season. Spit in the tube and again, your app makes the diagnosis and, and communicates that. Um, so diagnostics is shifting. In my world of oncology, we're moving to blood biopsies as opposed to uh, uh, tissue biopsies. We're seeing uh, laboratory tests you can print on demand, which might be important uh, during uh, uh, pl uh, interesting elements, whether it's the plague or Ebola. And of course, with all this new data coming at us, there's no way as clinicians, as patients, as healthcare ministers, we can keep up. We need augmentation. So AI sometimes threatens us, us docs. I like to call it not I AI, but IA, intelligence augmentation. We'll see AI infuse everything from how we staff our hospitals to how we design clinical trials. And as IBM and others start to partner together, we'll see this fusing. It may even be malpractice in 10 years not to have used an AI system to do a smart di a diagnostic workup or therapeutic decision. And as was mentioned uh, you know, wonderfully already, technology is just an enabler. Sometimes it needs to get out of the way. You know, in the US, we spend all the time typing electronic medical record notes and barely seeing the patient. My hope is we can improve the doctor-patient or nurse relationship by letting technology infuse and make the human part uh, more integrated. Briefly, a couple more minutes. Future of therapy. We want more tuned, precision, less invasive uh, therapies. And we're moving in interesting ways. Gene therapy with CRISPR is coming onto the cusp. Synthetic biology, not just reading DNA, but printing DNA is getting fascinating. We're seeing uh, uh, the ability now uh, to replace uh, uh, implants or take, for example, a pacemaker for the heart and use that same sort of approach for pacing the brain or the gut or the urinary system. We're seeing electroceuticals being used even for remote control uh, birth control which might lead to interesting conversations. You know, Honey, where's the remote? Or what if someone hacks your remote or hacks your pacemaker or your insulin pump? All the data privacy issues are in there. Lots of interesting elements. Sometimes, again, the technology surpasses the, the ethics and the policy. We're entering an era where instead of just prescribing you a drug or a device, I'll prescribe you an app or an app with the drug. And we're seeing the ROI from this. It may be an app for pregnancy or pre-op care or post-op care. We're seeing apps done by the Mayo Clinic that have reduced readmissions for heart failure by 40%. So true ROI by integrating simple information. We're in the era of telepresence now. You, you can connect to a clinician, not usually your clinician yet, on a smartphone. Soon with the incentives aligned, you may be talking to your doctor or your nurse and augmenting that with some of the tools like your home tricorder and making sense of this. We'll hear more from Dr. Catherine Moore about robotics. But robotics is playing a role in everything from the OR to anesthesia to enabling the disabled. The woman there who's paraplegic is walking with a wearable exoskeleton. And parts of that, you might notice, are white. They're actually 3D printed to match her own anatomy. And 3D printing is another area that's starting to converge into healthcare. Everything from taking your old-fashioned cast and making one that's printed for you. Scan your arm, print the one that matches your anatomy. We're seeing 3D printing being used by patients. This MIT grad student 3D printed his own tumor to help his surgeons. And he gave me an actual life-size version, right? That's an empowered patient for you, right? We're seeing uh, a Singularity University company sent the first 3D printer to the space station, which is hard to get supplies to. Imagine you need to print off a medical device, maybe on the space station today, maybe in the cath lab or the operating room of the near future. You can even print yourself. I sometimes carry around with me somewhere, mini me. You know, it might be fun to scan and have a little version of you, but, but if you have a patient who's missing part of their face, you can make a 3D printed prosthetic or 3D print the convergence of stem cell biology and regenerative medicine using the patient's own iPS cells to make micro livers, for example, to study disease and maybe fully print those that are therapeutic in the future for clinical trials as we're doing today uh, and beyond. My new startup is actually 3D printing your own personalized polypill made up of drugs and combinations based on you that eventually you'll print every morning like you might print out your morning uh, coffee. 
Two last sections, global impact. These technologies can democratize healthcare around the planet. The bottom billion all have SMS phones. Soon they'll have SMS phones, uh, smartphones. We have tablets now that are being sold for 50 pounds or less. We're having companies like Google start to connect the next three billion people on the planet and empower them to own their health. You know, the new drug is really all of us, the empowered patient. You can be the CEO and CEO of your own health if you're connected to the cloud, your own information, and you're empowered to understand that. We can deliver drugs and vaccines new, using fast moving technologies. Drones, this is a Singularity University company, delivering drugs and vaccines to parts of the world difficult to access after disasters or floods or beyond. Maybe drones will be delivering you a defibrillator uh, in, in the near future. Finally, discovery, right? It still often takes 70 years from something being published to translating to actual clinical use. We have new ways to do clinical trials. Downloading a clinical trial via mobile app has been pioneered by the open source platform called ResearchKit. So for example, for Parkinson's disease, whether you have it or not, you can download the trial. You can use sensors on the phone, voice, tapping to measure the progression of the disease and effects of interventions. And that's the beginning of, I think, crowdsourced smart integrated medicine. Just like when you drive with Google Maps or Waze, you share a little bit of your privacy, your speed and your location, but in response, you get the map. This is a map of Rome being built in a day. Imagine how long that would take to do by, by person, by cartography. But you get back the traffic, the patterns. What if we had that same sensibility in healthcare? What if we unsiloed the data between NHS and Kaiser and Stanford and Geisinger and across the planet? We could start to crowdsource, not just diagnoses, as a company like CrowdNet is doing, but smart therapeutics in real time. So I would urge us all be part of the future of medicine, not just be an organ or a blood donor, but be a data donor as well. Um, and integrate into all of this design thinking, because the technology itself, again, is only a piece of the equation. We can take lessons from other fields. I've been a pilot for years, a flight surgeon in the military. Military has informed things like checklists in the operating room, simulations, like we train pilots to fly. We can train surgeons and medical students. Simulators are, are there for everything these days, right? So we can improve uh, uh, training and education. Air traffic control to see where all your patients are and how they're doing and where the, where the thunderstorms might be. Lots of new ways to integrate uh, and make sense of this data. So, in conclusion, <laughs> we're in an exponential age. Uh, everything is moving faster and faster, and we don't often know where, we're all, where we are on the curve, as Vishal mentioned, but we know it's speeding up. So I would urge you, as you're innovating in the future, to look to where the puck is gonna be, as Wayne Gretzky, the hockey player, says. Don't go where the puck is now. Think about where AI, sensors, robotics, drones, 3D printing, nanotech uh, will be in the next couple of years. How can you integrate that and mash that up in new empowering ways to, to match challenging unmet needs that you might have as an individual or for your healthcare system or for your patients? So if we're smart about it and we do this, we can shift from this era of intermittent and reactive sick care, I think, to a world of continuous and proactive healthcare and realize even my old hospital at Mass General, even as an innovation unit now, we can all play a role in that um, we can all not just uh, predict the future, uh, but we can all go out there and create it together. So with that, thanks for your time and attention.